Good day and welcome to the Auxiliary Services Back to School video series. My name is Scott Denton and I'll be your host. Our goal is to provide information that will ensure a smooth start to our school year for the 2017-18 year. Thank you so much for joining us. There's much to discuss, so let's get started. This segment of our Back to School video will focus on school nutrition. With me today is Jim Keaton, our Director of School Nutrition Services. Good morning, Jim. I'm glad morning. you're with us. Good morning. Thank you. Let's uh, begin by talking about how we finished out last year. And I know one of, one of the things that the district has struggled with, and in all school nutrition budgets have struggled with, is breaking even or making a profit in school nutrition. Most school nutrition operations have lost money. Talk about what Durham Public Schools has done uh, to address this issue inside our district. Well, our district for the prior three years have had significant losses. Um, and this year we took a strong effort in looking at our menus and the feasibility of what the students actually like as opposed to just having menu items out there. We looked at what is the cost of every item. We surveyed students, we surveyed managers to find out what are they really eating. If there's something they're not eating, why are we spending money on it? And we streamlined the menus and we were able to cut our food costs about $200,000. Um, we looked at our vendors and the types of products they serve and the number of deliveries we're getting per week and we're able to reduce our cost there. Um, probably the biggest thing we looked at this year was our staffing and we had 210 full-time employees and we didn't necessarily need full-time, we needed more part-time to give flexibility for scheduling. So as people have left the district or retired or um, moved on, we've decided that we will fill those positions with part-time positions to give us more flexibility in scheduling and also reduce some of the benefit costs that are associated with that. So many of our viewers may be asking, well, why, what does that mean to me? Why, why is that important to me? And I, I think one of the answers that I would give is that if the district loses money in school nutrition, then that money has to come out of our fund balance to, uh, to provide for school nutrition, and we'd rather spend that money in the classroom. Exactly. Uh, school nutrition is a separate fund. It's called an enterprise fund where all of the money we take in is funds that we pay all of our expenses. We don't rely on the district for any type of expenses. And we need to be able to cover our expenses or the district will have to kick in. And that means cutting teacher positions. And we don't want that to happen because of child nutrition. And one of the things we've been able to do this year is we've been able to bring our costs in line and our increase our revenue through increase in participation, and we're expected this year to operate at just a slight profit for the year, and that money will go back into buying more equipment and things like that. That's great news, and I, I know that's been a huge effort to try to manage the school nutrition in a time where, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the other school districts are losing money. Yes. So that's, a, that's a great job, and we appreciate us being conscious of of trying to make sure our district is serving good nutritious food and at the same time doing it in a cost-effective way such that we're not a, a, a drain on, on expenses for the district. So let's talk about uh, another issue that came up during the year this year and it's a really big issue and that's competitive sales. Uh, competitive sales um, are, 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 are allowing vendors to come in during a time of the daytime and offer products to our students whether it be through a boosters club or uh, or vending machines or any other type of sale that would take away from school nutrition sales. Talk about what that law looks like, uh, what our fund, how our funding comes about from the state and what it means to our schools if that law is violated. Okay. Um, child nutrition operates with about a $16 million a year budget and over 14 million of that comes from federal reimbursement for the meals we serve to the free and reduced students. And we rely on that money to pay our staff, to buy the food, to pay for the equipment. And the federal government says, if we're giving you money to feed these children, you can't allow other people to come on property and feed the same children and make a profit at it because that's competing against the federal government's program. So the current situation in Durham is no food is to be given, sold, or distributed to children from midnight until 30 minutes after the dismissal bell. And that includes food trucks, that includes vending machines, it includes bake sales, it includes kids selling candy bars to go on a field trip. It, any food or beverages have to be provided by school nutrition services from midnight until 30 minutes after the dismissal bell. And we're willing to work with schools if they have a field day and they want to do a cookout. We're willing to say, we will provide the burgers, the hot dogs, the beans, the watermelon. We can provide whatever you want for a field day and then we serve the meals and we can get the federal reimbursement. That way we're not competing with the federal program. 
what happens now is somebody decides to have a field day, they bring in other people to cook the food and serve it, our staff can't reimburse that meal, so we've paid our staff to be there, we've bought food that now is not being served, and we're not getting any revenue, so it becomes a real drain on our financial services. So we're basically asking that if it has related to food until 30 minutes after the dismissal bell, please contact now. Child Nutrition and we'll work with you any way we can. If it's 30 minutes, if it's after the 30 minutes after the bell, as far as child nutrition is concerned, it's a free for all. You can do anything you want. But then you have to concern yourself with the wellness policy. And are you meeting the recommendation of the wellness policy? Right, so we have to be in compliance with wellness okay. policy as well. Yes. Um, the other piece about this is very significant is that if we're in violation of this particular um, requirement, then the district is at risk of losing child nutrition funds. Child nutrition funds, yes, and, and it can also, if it's considered systemic, they can also remove Title I funds from educational programs because they're all federal programs. And if they're, you're not in compliance with a federal program, you can lose all federal dollars. So this is much more than the $14 million for child nutrition. This, this could impact um, exceptional children. It could impact Title I. It could impact any federal dollars that come into the district. So I, I know we have an audit, um, uh, periodic audits from DPI, and some of them are more stringent than others or more detailed than others, but those audits tend to uncover these types of violations. And if they are serious enough, then, or maybe not serious enough, they, if they're identified, then that's reported back to the powers that be, and they, may, they can make a decision to withhold our funding or even ask for funding back. Yes. Um, and the... State audits us once a year. They considered a technical assistance review, and then every five years we get a federal audit, and that is the more intense audit. And we had that last year. And in one school that they were visiting, the principal was doing a um, ice cream social for the kids. It was after lunch, and she was doing an ice cream social for kids with certain grade levels or honors or honor roll. Um, they didn't withhold our funds then because it didn't impact our meal service, but they said it did violate the wellness policy because food, according to the state Board of Education policy, food cannot be used as a punishment or a reward. And by offering ice cream social during the day because of grades is a reward, and that's against the state Board of Education policy. So that's another piece that we need to consider as well. So I guess the message would be then, Jim, that any time a principal or AP wants to provide food, outside of the cafeteria. They need, really need to run that past your office to make sure it's allowed. Yes, yes. Okay, outstanding. Talk about, uh, as we start up school, uh, we obviously have lots of activity going on, particularly around free and reduced lunch. There's some requirements around free and reduced lunch, and I know we have some community eligibility schools that we've actually certified in the district. Um, let's start there and talk about community eligibility, how many schools we have certified, and how that certification process works. Um, community eligibility is a process whereby a school dis every individual school is looked at based on the number of students who qualify for food stamps or SNAP or um, that type of program. They're considered um, eligible based on their food stamp eligibility. And if a school is at 40% food stamp children, then they qualify to become community eligible. And then if a school is at 62.5%, food stamp eligible, the federal and government will reimburse us for every meal we serve at that school at 100% reimbursement. Um, currently we have 13, 12 schools that are community eligible and next year we'll be adding Eno Valley as a community eligible school where every child in those schools can have free breakfast and free lunch. The parents don't have to fill out applications. Um, it's a much easier, cleaner process and the community eligibility is good for five years. So that school will stay eligible for five years. All the children will eat for free. So for 2017-18, we have every school in the district is provided free, free breakfast for yes. our students. We have universal free breakfast for every student in the district. No application necessary for that. We encourage students to come out and participate. And really, breakfast is the most important meal of the midday. And if you're getting a chance at a free breakfast, come take it. Even if you only want to have the juice or the pizza, breakfast pizza, come get something and, and start your day off right. So we've got free breakfast for everybody, and we have 13, roughly one quarter of our schools are community eligible, which provide free lunch. Yes. It's a very attractive program that we've got serving a bunch of students. You also serve some food during the summertime. Talk about your summer program and how that reaches our families. Um, before the summer, I'd also like to say we offer after-school programs for free um, snacks to schools, and any groups that want to participate in that, as long as they're affiliated with Durham Public Schools and served on Durham Public Schools property, we can provide free snacks as well. You just have to contact our office, and we'll set you up with that. 
Um, for the summer program, we are the largest summer program in the state of North Carolina. We serve over um, 3,600 meals, breakfast and lunch every day for 39 days of the summer. Wow. Um, we deliver out two sites. We pack the food at two schools and we deliver it to community organizations, whether it's the churches, recreation centers, boys and girls clubs, the YMCA. We deliver the food to the sites and they serve it and then we're reimbursed based on every meal that we serve. And this year our program is estimated to bring in about half a million dollars in summer feeding money from the government. Outstanding. That's really a great service for our district to provide our, our community and, uh, and it's good to know those kids aren't hungry for the summer. Yeah. Uh, let's talk, Jim, about a little bit about uh, free and reduced lunch um, and what that looks like, applications, um, what your team does to prepare for that for the school year. When does that open up for a year-round schools even? Uh, how soon are those applications accepted? Go through that, that, uh, some of that process so that folks have an understanding about the free and reduced lunch application process. Um, the free and reduced program, we have to submit our renewal application to the state of North Carolina every year. And once we've received final approval on the renewal for the following year, then we can send out the applications to be uh, printed because we have to wait till we're approved to print them. Uh, we received our renewal um, approval this morning, so now we're going to send out to the printers to get our new applications for the 17-18 school year. Once those are back from the printers, we're anticipating the second week and maybe the first end of the first week in July getting those back, and parents can then start coming in and applying. We also have the application available. It'll be online on the Durham Public Schools website so that parents can go out there and print it off. Um, we do have to have the signed copy on file. We can't accept a fax copy. It has to be a signed copy. Currently, we have 66% um, of our students are free and reduced, which is a large number of students. That's over 20,000 students that are eating free and reduced lunch. Um, if a family is on food stamps and they're what's called directly certified so that we automatically get a download from the state so the family doesn't have to fill out an application. Okay. And we send those families a letter in the summer saying, you are directly certified, you do not need to fill out an application, which reduces the amount of paperwork that we have to do. So let's say that you had a family, that you know, a student that comes in to school, first day of school, and they were on free and reduced lunch last year, but they haven't submitted an application for this year. They get, still get to eat lunch, they, or they how does that work? If a child is on a status from the prior year, if it's free or reduced, for the first 30 days, it will stay with them. They will stay free or reduced for 30 days. That gives the family time to put in an application. <clears throat> After the 30 days, they become denied, and then they start accruing meal charges. And we try to avoid that. So about 10 days before that happens, we send letters to all those families saying, we do not have an application for this year. You need to apply as soon as possible. Another good reason to have Power School updated so we have good yes. addressing information to be able to reach the families, uh, good phone number information if we need to call them yes. to make sure we're getting the information we need to help serve these students. Yeah, our software um, imports the data from PowerSchool. So if the address that's in PowerSchool is the one we send the letter to and the parent is moved, we have no idea of how to reach that parent. We talked earlier today in a different video with transportation about the importance of addressing because obviously if they don't know where they live, we can't assign a bus stop to them. It's equally as important to you all to have that information so we can reach them in, in the event we have a, a situation to, c to cover like this, like, like these uh, free and reduced lunch applications. And another thing that would be important for principals and APs to understand is if they know they have students who are siblings in the same school or siblings at, at other schools, let child nutrition know because if one child is free, every child in that household is automatically free. And okay. what happens, it's called extending the benefits. And what happens a lot of times is one child will be free and eating lunch every day, another child at an elementary school, another child maybe at a high school and is not free and rings up the huge charge, and then we find out later that the child it has a sibling. We can make that child free based on the sibling's date, and we can reprocess all those meals so that negative balance comes off that child's account and that family is not responsible for that, and that way we get the money from the federal government for those meals. Outstanding, outstanding. Talk about money, I know we have... Um situations, particularly in the school year, where we have negative balances for some students. Talk about negative balances, what the impact is to the district, how do we collect those, and when the school gets the money, how important it is to go ahead and get it into school nutrition. Um, we send out letters on a weekly basis to the elementary schools in the backpacks that go home with the to the parents. That's a great way to reach the elementary kids. When you get to the middle and high school, you can send letters home with the kids, but we're never sure if they're actually getting home. Um, the middle schools, we send them out once a week as well. 
the high schools, we send them out once a month from the central office to the addresses that we have on file. Um, the negative balance letters go out. The parents can put money on their student accounts online. It's now a free service. It used to be a charge service. Every parent can set up an account and check what their child is eating, what meals they're eating. Uh, we encourage parents to look at that occasionally to make sure if your child has a negative balance and your child's not eating, contact us and we can change the PIN number. We can work on those issues as soon as we find out about them. Um, and then when the um, end of the year comes, we also send negative balance reports monthly to the principals to let them know which students owe money so that they can work with the social workers to get call parents to fill out applications as needed. And at the end of the year, <clears throat> whatever the negative balances are remaining at the school have to be paid back because child nutrition operates with federal funds and the federal government doesn't allow us to have negative balances. So we end up sending a bill to the district and the district has to cut a check to child nutrition to cover those negative balances. And that money cuts into money for teachers, for classroom supplies, because that money has to come from somewhere. And this year, currently, the negative balances that are not paid by the parents are at $128,000. So that's wow. a significant amount of money. So one of the things I guess we'd encourage our principals to do is to stay on top of this as the year progresses. Yes. Don't wait until the end of the year to try to collect the money. When you feel like you've gone only a few days past due, you really need to be working with parents then to notify them about the overage and try to go ahead and collect that. Yes. Yeah. Outstanding. Jim, you've done a great job of introducing new programs in Durham Public Schools. Talk about uh, any grants that you may have gotten, uh, status of fresh fruit and vegetable grant, uh, farm to schools program, those types of things, and how they might have, been, might have benefited our, our students and continue to benefit our students. Okay. Um, there was one program, it's called the Farm to School Program. It's offered by the Department of Defense and the USDA. And we started it about four years ago. We started, we wanted to see how it would go. It's where produce comes directly from farmers to the schools um, through the Department of Defense. And we started with $60,000. We wanted to pilot it, and it went tremendous. We were getting in interesting produce kids normally wouldn't get, like fingerling potatoes, tricolored broccoli, tricolored cauliflower. It was a way to get kids to get things they normally wouldn't have and to try to broaden their perspective. Um, the following year, we went to $80,000 because it was so successful. And then this school year, 17-18, we're going to $120,000. And that's money that the government gives us as a set-aside that we give to Foster Cabinets in Greensboro, and they provide us with local farm produce delivered one, uh, twice a month. Um, so it's a great way to get farm fresh products into the schools. Um, it's more nutritious. It gives the kids an opportunity to try something new. And it's federally funded, so it's not really cutting into into our program. Outstanding. Um, and the other thing that's exciting is there's a local food hub called the Farmer Food Share. And Farmer Food Share is in downtown Durham, and they've been working with us for the last three years to get local farmers' foods directly into the schools. And one of the challenges we have is, under federal law, we can't have anything in our school that's not from a farm that's not GAP certified which means that they have generally accepted practices of safe farming. Um, the Farmer Food Share <clears throat> worked with farmers to get them certified, and now the Farmer Food Share brings the product in, processes it into like chopped lettuce, chopped kale, chopped spinach, all fresh products, and deliver them directly to our schools. And we've been able to implement about $350,000 worth of fresh produce from local farmers, which is money that goes back into our local community and getting that produce directly to our schools. So it's been a tremendous help for us as well as the local community. Well, Jim, I really appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, as we close, anything else that you want to reemphasize about um, things schools need to do when they start up the school year, th important things to know about or, or reminders? Um, I think just communicating with child nutrition, letting us know what your needs are. There are a lot of things that we can provide that you may be not aware of. Um, cards for students to give to the students they can bring to the cashiers to make the lines move faster. We can print those cards right out of our software that has the student name, the student number. Um, if you have software for your student pictures, you can give us the CD. We can load them into our software and we can identify the students as they come through based on their picture. There, there's a lot of things we can probably do that we're not communicating enough with the schools. And um, contact us and let us know what your ideas are. We'd be happy to at least see what we can do about them. Um, we're also looking at increasing our catering this coming year. Um, we've been doing a lot with Bethesda Elementary and with the um, other departments through the district, and we're getting the message out that the food we have 
is good, it is healthy, it is fresh, and that we can provide it at a reasonable cost. And the money helps to support our staff. It gives them some extra hours. It allows our staff to get some additional income and um, keeps them employed um, at times when the, a lot of them would have to be out looking for second jobs. So. I'm really glad you brought catering up because I've heard nothing but positive reviews on the, on the number of catering events that you all conducted this year. And the quality of the food was excellent. The, uh, the service was very good, and so I encourage schools as well, if they have catering events, to contact School Nutrition about that. Thank you. And one other thing, I'm sorry, is if any schools are interested in doing a change to the breakfast program, we're really looking to increase participation. Currently, about two years ago, we were only serving 8,000 for breakfast. This year, we've served a little over 10,000 per day. Um, we're really looking to get up to around 15,000 per day. Um, if anybody wants to try a breakfast in the classroom program, let us know. Um, kiosks in the schools, if any high schools are interested in us bringing um, the, the little roll-up doors where they have concession stands in the school lobbies, we could set up food there and, and serve. Um, we're open to any type of suggestions, so um, get with us, let us know what your thoughts are, and, and we're, we definitely want to work with everyone. Well, I think it's uh, it's just goes without saying, but it, it is very, very true. We are committed to student achievement. All, all the, everything we do in operational services has to be focused on benefiting student achievement. And uh, of course, we know hungry children don't don't learn well. So anything we can do to increase participation, I agree. We, we should we promote that and participate with our schools the very best way we can to make sure that our kids have access to good, healthy food and they they're not hungry. So, again, thank you, Jim, for coming on, I and it. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, Thank you to everyone for tuning in to the School Nutrition uh, segment. And at this point, we'll close the segment. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.